change to 100 kilohertz if the signal is linear light, not circular. And at that time, I wanted to be able, I was no way I was able to capture a 100 kilohertz signal with an A to D converter. I showed you the sine wave before in 50 kilohertz. It's being captured easily now with a 16-bit A to D twins, which we can mark the data and do all sorts of neat stuff. In 1971, that was not possible. And so then I discovered that with this physical arrangement, modulator and the polarizer, making this analyzer, polarized light. I could see that it worked when I manipulated some things, but I didn't understand fully how it did. So happily there was a new fellow postdoc just arrived in the department from Tennessee. And he was very interested in computers, like I was, and that stuff. And I challenged him. I said, John, we can see this working. Here's my setup. But I can't explain why it works mathematically. At any rate, he went away. And in, I mean, for acting, of course, maybe. But eventually, in several weeks, he returned. Really outstanding analysis of the mathematics of the system. And the strategy to make it behave was to ignore the fact that the photoelastic modulator produced a 100 kilohertz sine wave, which we had no hope of seeing other than on the oscilloscope. We could not capture those data to process them. What's happening here is photoelastic modulator goes through a cycle. It is turned on or off, in which case, as we said moments ago, when it's off, it becomes simply a piece of quartz through which the light can go, a high-quality quartz. Now, so the light's coming this way through this quartz, and it hits a polarizer. So if we turn the drive signal to the photoelastic modulator, the PDM. It turns off and becomes a piece of quartz. Therefore, the light that's coming from our sample passes through a horizontally disposed polarizer. So we have vertical excitation and horizontal so this is I a perpendicular, I'm going to call it. Vertical, horizontal. Now, if moments later we turn the modulator on, but we overdrive it, it turns on in such a way that it doesn't, it saturates and it rotates the plane of polarization 90 degrees. So if it's on, this is with all. And if it's on, it rotates to play 90, and we get not perpendicular, but I parallel. Mm -hmm. And what we want is I perpendicular minus I parallel over there on the average. And if we if we look here, notice I we have here, and this is a good view. Parallel, perpendicular. Notice there are a factor of two different. Uh, notice the dramatic factor of two, which computes in an equation to the polarization of point four, uh, which is very slick. That is, we were able to capture high quality polarization data by without having to worry about high frequency stuff. Now. And without G factors. 
And without, oh yes, oh yes, a very important point in history which reminds us of. And this is the first one that existed this way. And uh, now, as you likely know, here we have a sample being excited by light, which is partially polarized. Any light coming through a monochromatic is in some way altered. And we don't know that alteration necessarily. And it may change with weight. That's true of this monochromatic too. Therefore, if we didn't use this technique, the first thing we would be doing now would be, let's determine the polarization character of these two so that we can generate correction factors, which in the literature you'll see as G factors. And it gets quite complicated and a lot of fiddling around as a function of weight. It's a real annoyance. Now here, notice what we've just done. We've got the very high quality polarization of fluorescence spectrum with a polarizer that is fixed in position and a polarizer that is fixed. Therefore, the polarization character of the outside world, the two monocomers, becomes totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Our sample is surrounded by fixed polarizers. If we were asked to turn the polarizer to make one or the other of these, we would not only do that, but we would have learned that the response of our monochromatic was different. So this is a very important characteristic. And it's the first one that does this. And it's simply, and we make the comments in our paper that we finally published, that uh, the sample, you know, the, the polarization character of the outside world is irrelevant because these two polarizers establish it and it doesn't ever change. No matter what sort of monochromatic you do, it doesn't matter. Which is a very nice thing. Now, 